Um, thank you for joining us. This is the Wealth Building Secrets for Real Estate Investors. And today I am going to be your special guest. My name is Abero Koye. I am a CPA and an active real estate investor, and I am the founder of the Wealth Building CPA. I own real estate investments across the eastern coast. I've been investing for the past 11 years, and I've been a CPA for 18 years. I've helped over 5,000 people like you prepare their taxes online and offline. And, of course, my greatest joy comes from helping clients, friends, and associates become free of financial stress. What is the Wealth Building CPA Advantage? We've been in the industry for so many years, so I'm very familiar with money-saving strategies, which I love to implement all of the time. Combined with my 18 years experience as a CPA and tax strategist and 11 years experience as a real estate investor and business owner. With this combination, it would be a great pleasure for us to empower you to make your life so much more profitable. And here is the Bencho team. We have Tom and Amy, TJ, Jen and Thomas, and Betty. Um, what's the Aurora Advantage? Aurora Real Estate Investment Services is a family-owned and operated business. They provide hands-off real estate investment opportunities just for you. And they've built a proven system that takes all the guesswork out of real estate investing. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Today we're talking about toxic LLCs. You know, I've seen a lot of people who tell me, oh, Abera, I formed my LLC. You know, I have my property in my LLC, and I think I'm good to go. But over the years, in the last six, seven years, um, as I've continued working with real estate investors, I've seen that a lot of people just have LLCs that are just purely worthless. Worthless because you're under the assumption that your LLC would give you the protection that you need, but in reality it doesn't. Um, so what do I call a toxic LLC? Your LLC is toxic if it does not shield you, if it causes your personal assets to be totally exposed, therefore you are not protected from legal actions when you should. It is not really the size of the entity, rather the existence of complete and proper documents, which provides protection from personal liability for the LLC members. So if you have an LLC and maybe you don't have an operating agreement, you don't have an EIN number, the operating agreement doesn't have everything that needs to be in there to properly protect you, you may have an LLC, but it really doesn't shield you. Because if you were to go to court or if you were to go to the IRS and you cannot present a properly executed operating agreement, your LLC is worthless and toxic. And toxic LLCs do not properly deal with bottom-up creditors, meaning when you have a claim and you get a judgment against an LLC that's arising from the company rather than from the members. And also, toxic LLCs will not protect you from top-down creditors. So you have to understand that there's a difference. When you're talking about asset protection, you have to deal with your bottom-up creditors and you also have to deal with your top-down creditors. Bottom-up creditors would come against an LLC based on the company, but top-down creditors will come against you based on what you do rather than what the LLC does. So your LLC is toxic if it doesn't protect you from both types of creditors. And um, your LLC is toxic if it does not save you in taxes when they should. And what do I mean by this? If you have a single-member LLC and you are earning all this money right now, the, the two primary ways that most, not all, but most real estate investors are making money in this economy is the wholesaling strategy or the buy and flip, you know, the rehabbing strategy. Both types of strategies result in active income subject to self-employment tax. But if you're using a single-member LLC, then it's not necessarily going to save you on taxes. So you may have an LLC, but because it's a single member, it's not going to save you on taxes because pretty much every income that you report is going to be subject to self-employment tax. Also, your LLC is toxic if it does not defend you against the IRS. Um, if you ever get audited 
by the IRS, what they want to see is your LLC documents. If they do not see your LLC documents, then pretty much they're saying that your LLC does not have a valid business purpose. So if you want to go to an IRS audit and win the audit, you need to have proper LLC documents. So right now, if you don't have those documents, that means that your LLC would not defend you against the IRS. And in that case, you are going to have to pay a lot of money and taxes that the IRS is going to judge. Because remember, at the end of the day, the IRS wants to know that you have a valid business. Again, your LLC is toxic if it does not prevent legal disputes with partners or others. I cannot tell you how many times I've had to be, in, be a mediator between two partners. You know, everything starts out well. You know, of course, we're always told to form the right teams. We're always told to, um, you know, bring in other people so you do deals together. But sometimes it always doesn't turn out well. It, it ends up, you know, not working out the way that we expect. And if you don't have the proper language in there, it does not prevent legal disputes with you and your partners. Your LLC is also toxic if it doesn't give you the important operating guidelines for successfully running your business. I tell all my clients, the goal of every business is to make money, not spend money. And so if you don't have the right guidelines on marketing, the right guidelines on budgeting, on how you're spending your money, yeah, you may have an LLC, but it's worthless and toxic because it's not helping you to run a successful business. So at the end of the day, you need to make sure that whatever LLC you have, that it has guidelines in there to help you successfully you run your business. See you. So most LLCs will not give you the significant dollar benefits that a well-designed and documented LLC should give you. Now, some people may be saying, oh, I'm only a one-man shop. Do I need all of this? The answer is yes. You even need it more so when you are a small business owner because the smaller the entity, the more the need for such documentation. Why? Because it shows the legal authorities and it shows the IRS that you have a meticulous attention to formality, and it helps def give your LLC the defined presence that you need as an entity that's dis distinct and apart from its owner, that has a life of its own. So when you are a small business, you're just starting out, maybe you haven't even bought any properties, or you're still starting out. By having everything properly documented from the start shows that you know how to give attention to detail and you are serious about making money in your business and showing that you have a valid business purpose. So where do you go from here? Um, our answer, what I usually advise my clients, when you come into my office and you tell me you have an LLC, usually what I want to see is I want to see your EIN letter. I want to see the articles of incorporation. I want to see your operating agreement. If I don't see your operating agreement, then I don't think that you have a valid LLC. Um, so one of the things that we need is to have a properly executed operating agreement. The operating agreement is the nuclear of the LLC. That's the heart and soul of the LLC. And you can use it in all 50 states. And it should be specifically designed for your real estate business. I cannot overemphasize the importance of having a specific business purpose in your operating agreement. Most times people just download an operating agreement from the website or they get something from an attorney, and it just talks about general, general um, things that relate to LLCs. You need to have an operating agreement that has a specific business purpose that is tied to real estate. It should be explicit. It should be clear. Not only is it going to help you in court, but it also helps you to establish what your real estate status is. You know, whether you're a real estate professional, are you a dealer, are you an investor, all those things. If you can show from the start that what your intention is based on your business purpose, that's what the IRS will go by and that's what the courts will rule. So like I said here, it helps you to avoid the tax status of being a dealer because you've clearly documented 
in your specific business purpose that your goal is to hold property. So what, what should be contained in a good operating agreement? A good operating agreement should have complete legal protection. Usually the LLC that we use is at least 121 pages in length. People may say that, oh, that's very lengthy, but because it contains over 240 legal provisions that should cover every aspect of real estate investing so that the LLC is separate and apart from you. It should help you to avoid disputes. So you have special provisions in there to help you avoid expensive trial lawyers and courts. It should have comprehensive tax savings provisions. There should be at least tax elections to give you favorable tax results to save you money. Let me give you an example. For You, you guys know about the amortization of startup costs or organizational expenditures. If you don't have those tax savings provisions in your operating agreement, sometimes when you go to file your taxes and you present your operating agreement to your CPA or to your accountant, whoever is doing your taxes, if you don't have those provisions in there, sometimes they will not know that some expenses are deductible for you as a real estate investor. So it also makes good business sense that your operating agreement spells out every tax savings provision that you need out there. Um, tax elections, there are special laws that um, allow you to deduct, you know, for example, if you take a home study course or you go on a boot camp or travel, there are tax elections and matters that you need to have in the operating agreement. That way you are able to take those deductions on your tax return. And these tax reduction strategies are specifically targeted to real estate investors. Remember I kept saying you need to have an operating agreement and an LLC that is real estate related, not just a general one that anybody out there can use. And finally, it should also be a business plan and tool. It should act as an operating guide to enable you effectively operate your real estate business. Um, right now, before I hand over to TJ, we're going to talk about the ultimate wealth building plan. Um, one of the things that we pride ourselves in doing is teaching people about wealth building. Real estate is supposed to help you build wealth. And um, to help you build wealth, one of the first steps is we need to do a financial needs analysis. Where are you right now? You know, do you have a regular job? Are you retired? Are you a full-time real estate investor? And then we look at tax planning and preparation and the different things that you need to do with that. We also look at entity structuring and formation, which is what we just talked about, making sure that your real estate strategy, that the structure that you come up with helps you with your real estate strategy. So you can't say that you're a rehabber, but then you go and form a C-Corp. You're going to pay a lot of taxes with that. So we start out with what's your real estate strategy, and then we find out the right structure to help you with that. And um, the next step is to actually get the business registered, set up your books. You want to have business analysis meetings at least twice a year. The goal of the business analysis meetings is to make sure that you are operating your business the way you need to so that you can make money. The reason why we're all doing this, why are we all in real estate, is because we want to develop passive income so that we can you know, stop working or be able to do other things. So all of that should come up in your business analysis meeting. And then also we need to look at the way you purchase properties. You know, I've seen a lot of people who have lost a lot of money because they did not buy right. For real estate, you make money when you buy, not when you sell. So that's when we look at your your property purchasing strategy to make sure that you are purchasing right. And I know that um, TJ is going to get into that pretty soon. And then we look at retirement planning as well. Make sure that you're saving enough money for retirement. And then this is very important. As a real estate investor, April 15th is not your deadline. Your deadline should be December 31st, meaning April 15th is the tax filing deadline, but December 31st is your tax savings deadline. So really, as a real estate investor, you should be taking a look at your financial picture November, December to make sure that you've put things in place before December 31st to save you on taxes. All right, um, right now I'm going to hand over to TJ. TJ, the floor is yours. 
Hey guys, TJ Bencho, um, co-owner of Aurora Real Estate Investment Services. I hope everybody's having a wonderful evening. And uh, first and foremost, I want to thank a bear for all that very useful information. Uh, I've learned a few things in that presentation. Thank you so much, a bear. Um, I also would like to state that I know several real estate investors who work with a bear, and I hear nothing but glowing recommendations and referrals. I know several people who are enlisted in, in the plan she just laid out, and what I've heard most commonly is it really helps them to be proactive instead of reactive, and that's what we need to do in this business. Um, so I suggest if you don't have any type of proactive pl plan in place right now that after this call, you email or give a bear a call um, immediately. Right? And it's the time to start is now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, pitching your business or, or pitching a deal. I, I consider both the same. Um, I, I, as you guys know, what I do is I present Pittsburgh, PA. I bring out-of-state real estate investors to come to Pittsburgh and invest. And I, I go to real estate meetings all around the world. I mean, mainly around the country, but I go to uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, Washington, D.C., which is where I met a bear. Um, I also go to Connecticut. I go to California. And we have investors from um, Australia. And what we do is we pitch our business and we pitch deals. Now, um, there's, there's over the past you know many years, there's been a lot of companies out there who do what we do, um, but only several survive. And the reason behind that, the companies that survive uh, step stand out from the crowd. As you can see, the the slide that's up right now, you got to be that one business, that one property that stands out from the crowd. And I'm going to give you some pointers as a business, as a real estate wholesaler, um, no matter what you're doing, on how to stand out from the crowd. So, Bear, can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay. Now, when I, I look at it from two different perspectives, two different points of, of interaction, your initial interaction and your long-term interaction. First, I'm going to talk about the, the keys for point of contact or initial interaction. Um, point of contact or initial interaction is when you meet a person in person for the first time or on the phone for the first time. And these are things, some of these th things seem like common sense, but they really, most people don't do them. And if you do them, you will stand out from the crowd. My number one rule when meeting people for the first time is do not sell your business or property build relationships. I can promise you that if you go into any, um, any point of contact with the intent of selling your business or selling a property, there's a very high likelihood that you're going to fail in that, in that point of contact because people can read that. People don't want to just buy a product. They want to build a relationship. This is going to help you for the long term of your business. Um, you're not going to be a transactional business. You're going to be a relationship business, and that's, that's how you survive in the long run, and that's how your business becomes passive. Um, one of the ways to do that is to walk up to people. Don't wait, to, don't wait for them to walk up to you. Um, I go to a lot of real estate meetings, and I'm usually a vendor member. And I'm one of the only vendor members that doesn't just stand by my table. I walk out into the crowd and meet people, and I attribute that in large part to my success. Um, you have to get outside of your comfort zone. If you just want to sit back and wait for it to happen, it's never going to happen. That's why only 3% of America own properties other than their primary residence because only 3% of America are willing to step outside their comfort zone. Um, this one seems really basic, but I can't tell you how often it does not happen. Smile and look people in the eyes. When I smile and look people in the eyes, it changes their whole demeanor. At first, you know, I'm coming from Pittsburgh. They think, what does this guy want from me? But once they see that I'm willing to look them in the eyes and be sincere, it opens them up to conversation. It shows that I'm a genuine person. I have nothing to hide. Um, this is a very big thing. Get and give out business cards. Do not 
go to a real estate meeting or any type of event or even out and about without at least a few business cards. You want people to remember you. Getting the business card is very important for your follow-up. That's gonna, You're going to see that in play in the long-term relationship portion because if you have their business cards, you have their phone number, you have their email address, and you can follow up with them. The follow-up is the most important thing to the long-term business relationship. If anybody knows me or anybody's had contact with me, you know that once I get your business card, you're on my email list, and you get about one, usually just one email a week. Um, that keeps me in front of you. Okay, Abir, can we move on, please? Yeah, before you move on, I did want to state um, I was representing a client about two months ago at an IRS audit. And you know what killed the audit for them? They did what? not have a business card. Get out of here. I'm serious because everybody knows that if you're in business to make money, you have to know how to advertise and market. And here's what the IRS auditor said. If you don't have a business card that you're giving to people, how do I know that this is not a hobby? Because you're, <laughs> if you're in it to make money, you should. the first thing that should be on your mind is how do I market? So I cannot tell you, even from an IRS perspective, even from a tax savings perspective, you need to have that business card. And there's so many places that you can get business cards, you know, really, really cheaply done online now. Go ahead, TJ. And I agree 100%, Abair. It's, it's about it's about presenting yourself in a professional manner. Um, whether you're whether you're a real estate investor and you own one investment property, whether you're an aspiring real estate investor and you don't own any investment properties, or whether you own a hundred investment properties, um, the way that you move forward in your real estate investing career is by being professional. This, if, if you do, if, if a person does not take real estate as a serious business, um, I, I, I have a hard time seeing how they will succeed. Um, so uh, another part of that is when you go to meetings, when you're presenting your business or you're presenting your property, have a professional flyer. Don't go with a black and white flyer that um, you know is jumbled up and it's hard to see the words. Spend a lot of time in your flyer. Even though you, you know, I, if I hand out 60 flyers at a meeting, when I leave at the end of the night, I probably see 30 lying around. But that's okay because another 30 people took those flyers home. And even if they don't take them home, when they're colored and they stand out and, the, and they're, um, they're detailed, they're accurate, my contact information and logos on there, I'm building a presence in their mind. I'm building an image. And that's what we need to do as professionals. We need to build an image of ourselves. Um, when, you know, when I present properties, I try to put as much information on there without putting too much, show a nice picture of the front of the property, and make sure it's colored because it really sticks out. Now, this, is, this goes right along with that. This is a big one. Have a website that makes sense. If you're a wholesaler, um, if you're a landlord, um, no matter what you are, no matter what kind of business you are, have a website that makes sense. It doesn't have to cost you a ton of money, but it has to make sense compared to what your business does. For example, my website's called www.investinpittsburgh.net. I bring investors from out of state to invest in Pittsburgh. My website name lines up with exactly what I do, and when you go to my website, you'll see that everything on my website is in line with investing in Pittsburgh. It's not a very complicated website. I think it's a very simple website. I put all the content on there myself, and I'm not a very complicated person, but it gets the point across. And I'm not saying that I have the best website, but I am saying that you should have a website. I know – here's something, for example. I didn't have a website until about – I think it was last May or July. And ever since I got my website, my business doubled just from having a website. So I'm, I'm proof of the power of having a website. People want to research you. They want to see that you have a website to see that you're professional. A few intangibles about um, the point of contact when you meet somebody is to be a hundred percent upfront and honest. People are going to ask you questions. Is that would you agree with me on that, Abir? Definitely. Oh, definitely. And if you lie, 
you're going to get caught in your lies, even if it's a small white lie. If you are 100% upfront and honest, no matter what people ask you, you're always going to give the same answers. And that way, I'm, I just like to do business with honest people myself. That's why myself and a bear get along. Um, but you, believe me, it'll come out if you're lying. Always be 100% upfront and honest. And my favorite answer is, I'm not sure. I'll get back to you. I don't try to make up answers because people know when I'm trying to make up answers. Um, I just went to buy cars. I just went to shop for a new vehicle on Saturday. I spent all day. I went to about seven different dealerships. And I can tell you that I caught a few a few car salesmen trying to make up answers that they didn't know, and it really turned me away from buying that particular car. Um, another intangible is know the market inside and out that you are pitching, whether that's a real estate deal or your business. Do research. Study your business. Know it inside and out. You can ask me a ton of questions about Pittsburgh. You can ask me a ton of questions about our real estate investment deals, and I I could answer most of them. The ones that I can't, I'll tell you I don't know, and I'll get back to you. But I would like to say I know my market pretty pretty much inside and out. And I've heard a bear speak several times, and I could tell you that she knows her market. She knows the CPA world, especially for real estate investors, inside and out. So, Abir, can we move on to the next one, please? And while you're moving on, um, one of the questions I usually get when people are trying to form LLCs is, you know, what name should I use? And I kind of like this name. Usually, um, you know, one of the things that TJ said was have a website that makes sense. You know, in other words, use have a name that makes sense. So usually what I suggest to people is if you're going to form an LLC with a name that you're very passionate about, maybe it resonates with you, you know, like a TJ Bencho LLC, if investing in Pittsburgh is what makes sense, then what you want to do is to register TJ Bencho LLC as the parent LLC or the official name of the business, and then turn around and register a trade name, investing in Pittsburgh. And usually that trade name, a trade name is always associated with a parent or with a company. So if you have TJ Bencho LLC and then you turn around and you do investing in Pittsburgh as a trade name, you don't have to use TJ Bencho in any of your material. You can just drop that and just use the trade name investing in Pittsburgh. And when you file your tax returns, you would say TJ Bencho LLC DBA, meaning doing business as investing in Pittsburgh. So that's one way to solve that issue of if you have a name that you're very passionate about, but you know that when you go out there and you put it on your business card, it's not going to make sense, go ahead and use the name that you want to use on the official document and then turn around and register a trade name. I know that in Maryland, it only costs $50 to do it. And you can have as many trade names as you want associated with um, a company. Go ahead, TJ. Great advice, Abir. Thank you very much for that. Um, I want to move on now to the keys for long-term follow-up interaction. Um, this is after you've met the person, you've, you've gotten their business card, you've spoken to them, they got to know who you are, you were upfront and honest, very professional. Um, now... You go home, and the next day comes, okay? Um, you give them a call, or they give you a call. This is something that um, I, if I'm looking to do business with something, somebody, and they don't follow some of these principles, I end up not doing business with them. I consider these things very important for a long-term business relationship, and I, and I do my best to follow these principles. The number one thing for me is to return phone calls and emails within 24 hours. Now, I know things come up, guys, but for the most part, I'm talking about to return my phone calls and emails within 24 hours. This shows that that your business matters to me. You matter to me, whether it's business or not. You matter to me as a person. Um, so I, I take that very seriously, and you'll see as as we build a relationship and we do business together, um, one of the reasons that I, I have very long-term relationships with my, my clients who become my friends is because I respond to them and I get back to them. Um, number two, 
Be willing to spend time and energy to build relationships and educate potential clients. I can't tell you how important this is. This is for long-term relationships. If you're just looking to be a transactional business, um, you're you're not going to want to talk to people who aren't going to buy from you right away. I've literally spent a year and a half to two years with clients before they ever bought with me. And now those are some of my best clients. One of my best clients who's bought four properties from me but ha- who has sent me nine, nine other investors who combined have bought 14 properties from me. I spent two years with that client before they ever bought with me. I was patient. I can't tell you at times I didn't get a little frustrated, but guess what? I bit my tongue. I educated. I built that relationship, and it grew strong and to the point right now where we have – he's my best client. Number two, don't be all business. Let people know who you really are. When, when investors come in to spend the day with us in Pittsburgh, we go out to eat with them several times. Sometimes we take them to our, our, um, our own house to eat. They stay in our city house. Sometimes we go out to a ball game together. We do a lot of different things so that, so that my potential clients or my clients can know who I really am. That's really important. My business isn't what I do. It's who I am. And if you don't like me as a person, then we may not be able to do business together. But I'll, I want you to know who you're doing business with. Um, very, very important. Deliver on what you offer. If you're offering a business that's going to save somebody money or make somebody money, make sure your business can deliver that. Always uh, under-promise and over-deliver. This is a huge, huge um, factor. Do not overpromise to get the sale and then under deliver. You're, you're not going to survive in business. We always use high expenses, low income, and then when it comes in higher, our investors are very happy. If we did it the other way around, we wouldn't be in business right now. Everything that I said builds credibility. Okay, it, it, it allows people to really trust you and really want to do more business with you and to give you referrals, and what, and which in turn builds references and testimonials. The most important thing I have on my website is my testimonials. And when I go to real estate meetings and I'm talking to a potential investor whom I'm speaking to for the first time, and I can refer them over to another investor who's already invested with me, that says more than me saying a million words. Can we move on a bear, please? He just, he just wiped his mind. You want to give me that? You better... Okay, this is this is our invitation to you. Aurora Real Estate Investment Services formally invites you to come spend the day with us in Pittsburgh. By coming to spend the day with us in Pittsburgh, we'll accomplish um, three important goals. First and foremost, like I said, we will build a relationship. Whether we do business or not, I don't pressure you to buy a property when you're here in Pittsburgh. Whether we do business or not, we will build a relationship, hopefully a friendship that lasts a lifetime. Number two, you're going you're gonna to get education and experience as to why Pittsburgh is a solid investment. Pittsburgh has been ranked the number one most livable city two years in a row. You're going to get to see why firsthand. If you come to the Capital Area RIA tomorrow, I know some people in here aren't uh, members of Capital Area RIA, but if you come to the Capital Area RIA tomorrow, you're going to hear an investor who did the tour with us two weeks ago, and um, he, he got to learn a lot about Pittsburgh on that tour, and he's going to explain to you what the tour was like and what he learned. You, we educate you. We take you to historical points of Pittsburgh. We take you to um, – the, the, the businesses that surround and, and support Pittsburgh, we, you really get to learn a lot. That's very important. Um, and the third thing is you get to, you get to visit past, present okay. projects and projects that are, are available. So you get to really see the work we do firsthand, and you get to you see the, the areas we're investing in firsthand. You don't walk on the street. Hello? Okay, yeah, so... Go ahead, all... PJ, please, if you're on the line, um, please mute yourself. Um, 
so that we can continue. Go ahead, TJ. All you have to do to um, come spend a day with us in Pittsburgh or just to learn a little bit more about on how to pitch a deal, I would be more than willing to spend time with you to educate you on how to pitch your deal. You can email me what your deal looks like, and I can help you put it together in a nice presentation. All you have to do is call me at 412-498-2790, 412-498-2790, or email me at tjbencho at comcast.net. I would also love for you to visit my website, www.investinpittsburgh.net. I thank you so much for all your time, and I thank you so much, Abair, for for us working together on this uh, presentation. All right. Thank you, TJ. Thank you, everybody, for listening. we covered a lot on here, and one thing um, about Pittsburgh is I actually also invest in Pittsburgh. That's how TJ and I got together. I love Pittsburgh. Um, that's been one of my best performing properties. That's a property I bought in 2005, and it's never been without a tenant. Um, when we have one tenant, I think we have a third tenant now in seven years, but when one tenant is moving in, moving out, before they're moved out, we have another tenant that moves in. So that's been one of my best performing properties. Um, Right now we're going to open it up for questions. I'm sorry about the background noise. Um, One of the things about Wealth Building CPA and Aurora Real Estate Investments is we want to be we want to make this personal. We want our webinars to be personal. We want you to be able to ask us questions. We don't just want to put it on lecture mode and not give you the opportunity to ask questions. But we also ask people to respect that. Um, that you kind of keep the lines clear so that questions can properly come true. Um, if you want to do a consultation with me, um, you see our phone numbers. And for those that are just on the phone, you can give us a call at one eight 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 five zero two three seven six seven one eight 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 five zero two three seven six seven, or you can visit us on the web at wealthbuildingcpa. Com. So right now I'm going to open up the line to any questions. If you have any questions about what you've seen about having a toxic LLC and what you need to do to fix that, about knowing how to pitch a deal, how to run a good business, we leave the lines open right now. I'm going to go ahead and switch off um, from having the PowerPoint open so that I can see the questions that people um, have sent in online. All right, I have a lot of questions that have come in here, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with that, with those questions that are on here. But if you want to ask a question while we... um, you know, while we go ahead, that's fine. You can go ahead and get those questions um, asked. Um, so let me scroll down here for a little bit. Give me a sec on here. Why? Um, yeah, I see somebody here saying that please mute yourself if you're not speaking. So we're asking you to please be respectful of... Um, other people that are on the line. That's usually the reasons why um, people don't want, you know, usually don't like to keep the lines open is because you have people talking in the background. But we don't want to do that. We want this to be a very personal call. Um, One of the questions, this is from Jason, can C corporations be a member of an LLC? Absolutely. Anybody can be any entity can be a member of an LLC. But usually what I advise people is you don't want a situation where, because I've seen people who form C-Corps to do real estate, and at the end of the day, it's not really helping them. So if you are going to form a C-Corp to be a member of the LLC, make sure that your real estate business is at that point, you know, where you need a C-Corp, meaning you have employees, fringe benefits, and all those things that were rent using a C corp in your real estate business. That you know, usually that's when you've advanced and you've hired um, a lot of people. All right. Um, Mike is asking: Is an LLC preferable to an S corp for real estate investment business? That answer depends on your real estate strategy. Um, one of the things that I've said in the past is 
Most people out there will tell you form an LLC, form a C-Corp, go to Nevada, go to Wyoming. Our, our, one of the things that Wealth Building CPA does is to find out where you are. What is your real estate strategy? The entity that you form should be based on what your real estate strategy is. So if your real estate strategy is rehabbing or wholesaling, bird dogging, basically anything that generates active income, then it would be better that you have an S corp because with that you can um, lower your self-employment tax by paying yourself a salary. So if you make $100,000 and you pay yourself $50,000, only the $50,000 will be subject to self-employment tax. The rest of the 50000 will just be subject to regular income. Um, but if you have an LLC or a single-member LLC, all of the $100,000 will be subject to tax. So usually my answer to that question is start out with your real estate strategy and then find a structure that fits. It's not a one-size-fit-all in real estate. All right. Um Another question, if I'm buying and selling very casually or lending private money for rehabbers and not as a formal business, do I need the formality of an LLC? Wouldn't the LLC then put me in the position of needing to pay Social Security taxes? Well, um, if you're in the business of buying and selling very casually or lending private money, buying and selling very casually means that you're a rehabber. And if you're not careful, um, without having the formality of an LLC, and especially one of the things that I said um, in my presentation is defining your business purpose, if you don't define your business purpose in that operating agreement, the IRS could come back and classify you as a dealer. And when they classify you as a dealer, that means all of the income that you make is subject to self-employment tax. So my answer to that question is yes, even more so for you, Mike, because you are buying and selling. You need the formality of an LLC because your operating agreement is what's going to spell out your business purpose so that the IRS does not see you as a dealer and end up treating all of your income as income that is subject to self-employment tax. Um, all right, how does having an LLC registered in your personal name separate you from the business? I don't know what you mean by having an LLC registered in your personal name. Um, technically, you're not supposed to have an LLC registered in your personal name. You're supposed to have an LLC that is separate, completely separate from you. I'm going to try to put this on um, lecture mode um, because we're getting a lot of interference. So I'll answer the questions that I have on the screen, and then I'll come back and answer the other questions later on. Okay, I hope you guys can still hear me. Can an S Corp be a member of an S Corp in New York? I'm not quite sure I understand that question. Um, if you can retype it, can an S Corp be a member of an S Corp in New York? An S Corp can be a member of another S Corp, if that's the question. I don't know about the New York whether you're asking in that specific state. But generally, yes, the S-Corp can be a member of another S-Corp. Um, can I see? Okay, we've already answered that. Yeah, like I said, I'm not quite sure about this question about having an LLC registered in your personal name. You technically should not have an LLC registered in your personal name. Maybe what you're asking is if when you register the LLC, you have to say that you're the owner. You really should not say that you're the owner. Usually when I do articles of organization for my clients, nowhere on that article of organization that we register with the state would anybody know that this LLC is associated with the owner. We make sure that we have a separate, you know, we have a separate um, registered agent and that we are the organizers. So as their CPA, we become the organizers for the LLC. So I don't know if that's the question, Steve, that you're asking, but I hope I answered it. 
Could I have multiple trade names? Um, yes, the answer is you, you can have multiple trade names with the same LLC. So the answer to that question is yes, you could have multiple trade names um, named after you. Absolutely. There, there's no limit to how many trade names that you can use. Um, If I'm holding properties under LLC for asset protection, what is the practical dollar limit would you recommend for each LLC holding? It depends. This is a facts and circumstances question because it really depends on what's going on in your financial picture. You know, when I talked about the wealth building plan, one of the things that we look at is your financial needs analysis. Do we need at this point to limit the dollar amount to maybe a hundred thousand for asset protection, or are you fine with two hundred and fifty thousand? You know, do you have an umbrella policy? What kind of strategy are you pursuing? You know, is this a buy and hold property, or is this a property that you're just rehabbing to flip for profit? All of those things will determine what the dollar limit. There's no, you know, I don't give um, one dollar limit to everybody. It's based on, you know, when we sit down and have our business analysis meetings, these are the things that we look at. Um, all right, I think um, I see a couple of more questions. Yeah, I'm going to app open, answer that, and then I'll... Um, Open it up. Can the attendee with the baby – oh, I'm sorry. They were saying here you should mute yourself. If you have defined your business purpose in your operating agreement as owning rental property, but you sell several properties a year, will that prevent you from being classified as a dealer? Um, and it should prevent you because one of the things that we have in our operating agreement is that we state that your business purpose is to – and, you know, it's for long-term investment. So owning a rental property is like long-term investments. But that from time to time, you may engage in other real estate strategies out of financial necessities for the business. So one of the things that we say is, you know, unless it's dictated by working capital necessities. So as long as we put it on there, what we're telling the IRS and the courts is that, Yes, our primary purpose is to invest in long-term investments, meaning rental property, but from time to time, we could sell several properties just to be able to meet the needs of the business. And we actually have two pages where we list reasons why you may need to sell that property. That's why you now understand why we have 121 um, 121 page operating agreement. Um, I'm a carpenter by trade and just started a business that provides property solutions for maintenance and investing. Now, should I separate the two businesses? My plan was to invest in rehab and do the work myself and pay carpentry business with my real estate business. Is this a wise approach? Usually what I tell clients, absolutely. I usually advise that you start out small. Then as the business starts to grow, you can spin off. So it's okay um, to keep it together for now with the understanding that you have a plan in place you are reviewing. That's another important thing that I want to say. Your entity structuring meeting, your LLC formation, all of that should be reviewed every year because the strategy that works this year may not work next year. You know, So one of the things is you know, the, to, the, to answer this question, it's okay that you keep it together, and then as the business starts to grow, you can do the separation at that point because one of the things you also have to deal with is for as many businesses that you set up, you also have to deal with the compliance requirements, the tax filings, and all of that. So usually what I do is I sit down with my clients and see where they are and determine if we need to do the split at this point or to continue it on. Okay, I'm going to open the lines up. It's 8.02 right now. Um, we're coming to the conclusion of the call. If you have, um, 
I'm going to answer one last question, and I'll open it up for anybody that's on the phone that wants to ask a question. If you need to amend your operating agreement, how do you do that? Basically, um, two things that we recommend. Depending on the nature of the original operating agreement, sometimes we tell you to just scratch it and supersede it with an existing, um, with a new and improved operating agreement. If the existing operating agreement that you have is okay, then you simply add an addendum to that existing operating agreement, indicating the new items or the new um, the new sections that you would like to update. So it depends on what the existing operating agreement looks like and whether it makes sense to go ahead and just supersede it with a new one or to just do an addendum to the operating agreement. All right. Um, I'm opening this up for questions now. If anybody on the line has any questions, you're free to ask it at this point as we get ready to wind down. Does anybody have any other questions? Oh, I have a question. Go ahead. Yes, um, I wanted to know, um, I have an online business that I'm working and also uh, an LLC, but I don't do much with the LLC. What I need to do is really get established uh, with the properties, you know, and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. But what do you suggest? Do you suggest that I... Uh, start it all over again, the LLC, or do I need to take it where I left off? Tell me, what's the history with that LLC? So how long have you had it? Oh, since since oh eight. Okay, and that's the one you were using for the online? No, it's separate. Uh, that's two different businesses. The online business is a different business from the um, real estate, the LLC. So the LLC that you have was for the real estate? Yes. And you're asking now whether you can use it for the online business? No, I'm asking do I need to uh, start it all over again since it's been so long? And um, I need to really get it up where it will be up and running and benefit me. Like you say, I feel it's toxic, like what you were explaining tonight. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the things that we look at is um, at, what, you know, at what stage is it at, um, depending on what, um, which state the LLC is registered in, one of the things that we look at is, are you up to date on your file? First of all, is that LLC currently in good standing? Meaning, have you filed all the documents that you need to? If you haven't, like let's say since 2008, you haven't filed your annual return for that LLC with the um, Department of Assessment and Taxation, it's possible that that LLC could already be forfeited. I cannot tell you how many clients every year come into my office telling me they have an LLC, and when we go, because standard procedure, we always want to pull the good standing certificate. When we go to pull that, the LLC has been forfeited. So a lot of people are walking around thinking that they have an LLC, but you really haven't met the compliance requirements over the years. The LLC could be forfeited. So if the LLC is forfeited, then you now look at the cost of reinstating it, whether it's worth it, because now you got to pay all the back licenses and stuff. The other option is, you know, depending on where your business is and what's going on, it might make sense that you pay those fees so that you can maintain the history. You know, okay. As well. All right. All right. Any other? That was a good question, by the way. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'll go first. Uh, uh, with the uh, LLCs, uh, what is the best? Uh, tax date, uh, or do you have a choice of a tax date for your fiscal year, a, a tax due date, a filing date? Um, not really, but um, typically we've just done calendar year, December 31st. So do I have some clients that do have fiscal years? But, um, you know, it depends. Like I said, some of these answers are really facts and circumstances answers. But most most of the real estate investors, I'll say 99% of the real estate investors that I've been working with, we all just use calendar year, December 31st. I only have, you know, out of the 550 clients that I work with, we I think only have one real estate client that has a fiscal year. And we're, we are getting ready to file an election to change that back to a calendar year. 
Okay. I have one other question, but I'll let the other person go ahead and ask. No, you can go ahead. We we we're, we will stay on the call for as long as we need to. That's the the beauty of this um, webinar is we don't want to rush people over the phone. We want to make sure you get your questions answered because we know that typically in most other webinars, you know, questions are not answered live. So go ahead. Okay. Um, I I have uh, one L L C that you know, completely set up and all that, and I would like to make an appointment with you to have you to go over everything that I have. Um, how difficult is it to change? I have another LLC, and I want to change the name of that LLC. It's very easy. A- all you would simply do is to file um, an article of amendment with the state to change the name. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, and um, if you want to make an appointment with me, you can call our um, 1-800 number. It's 1-888-502-3767, or you can go online at www.wealthbuildingcpa.com um, and just fill in the um, consultation box. We usually offer free one-hour consultations to answer any questions that you have and to you know give you guidance. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, I have an LLC, but the purpose is not all uh, real estate, mm-hmm. and uh, I would like to change. I was wondering if I can change that into um, a new LLC, and also yeah, the registered need- agent <coughs> is me. In that LLC, the registered agent is me. I would like to change that as well. So can I just convert that old LLC into the new one? Yeah, you can file, just like I told the lady before you, just like you can change the name, you can also do a change of resident agent. Please, guys, I always advise people, you don't want to be your own resident agent, and you don't want to use your home address. With Google Maps and everything that's going on now, people can go online and find that you are using a residential address for business and they can tie it to you. And by you stating that you are the resident agent, any reasonable person out there knows that if you're the resident agent and you're the one representing yourself as the manager of this company, more than likely you're the one that owns it. There's a lot of resident agent services that you can pay a fee um, in your state for one year. We offer resident um, agent services in Maryland and D.C. for $75 a year. It doesn't cost that much to use somebody else as your resident agent. You need to, the whole goal of forming the LLC is to protect yourself. But when you put your home address on there and put yourself as a resident agent, you're kind of defeating the whole purpose of forming the LLC in the first place. You know, but to change you, there is a form where there's a change of resident agent form. And if you email me, depending on what state um, you are, we can get you that form to change the resident agent from, you know, from you to another person and you can also change the name if you want. But you can track all of that, right? Just like you said that um, using the Internet, someone can look uh, and see who's the resident agent in their home, and then if that gets converted to another name or another entity, then you can track that and say, oh, okay, this was the person, and now it's been converted to a new name where the resident agent is someone else, and the address is someplace else, but we still know from that parent, from that fourth LLC, that that's the owner. Well, that's true. If depending on what state you're located, it's not every state that would have that. And depending on what your real estate strategy is, and depending on what your exposure is, then we would usually advise go ahead and just shut that down and start over. I mean, how much money are we talking about? You know, in Maryland is $195, in D.C. it's 100 Every state has their own fees. But depending on what your real estate strategy is and what the risk exposure is with the legal liability, sometimes I tell people go ahead and change the resident agent because not everybody is going to be sophisticated enough to go on there and see, you know, to monitor that change. Some people will. Not everybody will. So by changing it right now, you've kind of, um, whittled down the number of people that you're exposing yourself to. But then depending on where you are in your real estate investing career, yes, it may make sense that you completely get away from that existing LLC. It doesn't cost much to do that. Um, I prefer that. Yeah. I have one All other. All right, any other questions? Yes. When 
it seemed like to me when I uh, am on, is in the state of Maryland, and I noticed, uh, do they require your personal information when you are filing that application for the LLC? No, the, there's only five sections on there. The name of the LLC, the address of the LLC, the business purpose of the LLC, the resident agent, and the resident agent's address. That's it. And then you just sign. And that's what it is in most other states. And what most people don't know is that sometimes just because you're being asked for information on the articles of organization does not necessarily mean that you need to provide it. You can have your own articles, and you only have these five items filled out. That's why for my clients that are in the state of Maryland, that's what I use, that form that only asks for those five things, and we don't go beyond that. In D.C., they would actually ask you for who the member is and who the organizer is, as the CPA for that client, I make myself the organizer because I'm the one organizing those documents. That way we are sure that nowhere in this public document is this LLC going to be associated with the client. All of that, everything, who owns the LLC and all of that is spelled out in the operating agreement, which is a confidential document that you keep in your records. As you know, when I looked on the back of my papers that I got from my LLC, they did have my name up there. So now because I probably you put in the filing parties return information on there. That's probably what happened. Yeah, now, because so there's a there's a way. section where they will ask you who do they return this information to. If you have the filing party as yourself and not just an address, then, yeah, more than likely your name is going to be on there. And that's well, why, I like I, I said, I I'm sorry. I looked on the back of the, my, my, my papers, and I don't know well, I guess I must have put it up there because I was trying to be careful not to give them, you know, to have that information available. Yeah, if you if you send me an email or, you know, if you contact me, I'll be able to go online and look and tell you exactly where they pulled it from because that's a public document. So we can go in and see exactly where they were able to pull. You had to have provided it to them somewhere for it to be on that stamp. Hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I have there? a question. Mm-hmm. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, my question has to, uh, first of all, I appreciate this webinar. I'm learning a lot, and uh, thank you. And uh, my question has to do with how many LLCs I can uh, create without getting noticed by IRS if I were to use LLC for uh, flipping properties. And if I flip a lot of properties, that, that means I create a lot of LLCs. Mm -hmm. Would that be a concern? No. Actually, let me tell you this. I have a client, um, my background actually as a CPA was I did consult for one of the largest real estate um, investors in the area. And uh -huh. this, this real estate investor has an LLC for each property. I think we have at least 500 LLCs for this client. So wow. actually what we do is we don't even submit the names of those LLCs anymore. We just submit a spreadsheet because there's no way we can possibly get the names of all those LLCs on his tax return. So all we do is we use a worksheet, a spreadsheet, and in his tax return we put available upon request. Wow. Yeah, so you can do as many LLCs because remember the IRS should not control your business. You should control your business. And if but asset protection requires that you have separate not, LLCs. Uh, would that I'm make sorry? any difference? Sorry, say that again. Uh, if they're trying to determine whether you're a dealer or not, uh, they see that you've got a lot of LLCs, a lot of properties are moving. I heard that uh, maybe more than five properties a year you're likely no, to No, um, the whole dealer. dealer status is a facts and circumstances issue. There's no, okay. there's no place in the IRS code that says if you do one, two, three, four, five, you're a dealer. Uh -huh. There are things that they look at, such as how frequently you do it, how many do you do in a year. Mm -hmm. And that's why your operating agreement is very, very important. Because if in your operating agreement you say that you are a long-term investor, and it just happened that this year you you bought and sold 10 properties, if you can establish that it was out of investment necessity, that's why you sold those properties, you can make the case that you're still not a dealer. Just because you sold a property doesn't mean that that was your intent. You could intend to hold those 10 properties and 
guess what? Something happened, in, you know, in the river, and you got to get all the sand to drain the river or whatever, so you had to sell all these 10 properties at once. It's a facts and circumstances case. Oh, okay. They wouldn't necessarily classify those properties as an inventory, per se. No, it be, because it's the, owners, the burden will be on you, and that's why we start out with the operating hmm. agreement. And oh, there's okay. several reasons why you could decide to hold a property and middle of the year, you decide that you need to get rid of them. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. One other now, what do you charge for creating an entity? Um, I am going to put on here right now. Um, we okay. have an LLC forms um, package that we offer at six ninety five, uh-huh. and that's something that we consider, you know, very reasonable given how much attorneys out there are charging. You are going to get a link. Um, to our website to tell you how much that is. If you sign up for our wealth building plan at nineteen ninety five, that covers all of our services for one year. So that would cover the preparation of your tax returns. That would cover the entity formation, the LLC formation. That covers your business meetings. That covers your year-end tax planning, and you get unlimited consultations with me. That also covers you for a consultation with TJ and I on where to invest. You know, regardless of where, you know, whether you're going to do Pittsburgh or what your strategy is, you know, we would have a free consultation with you to help you in your investing. So there's, you know, there's two ways that you can work with me. It's pay as you go plan or you sign up for the wealth building plan and get those services for one year. Okay, how much is wealth building package? It's 19.95 and if you're a member of any of the existing um Real estate clubs, we give you a three hundred dollar discount. Oh, okay. And uh, so that information, well, I'm going to make an uh, appointment to come see you anyway, but then so I'll be able to get all that information then. Yes. And um, after this call, everybody that did register for the call, and if you did not get um, if you did not get a, a meeting confirmation, and you're on this call. Please send me an email to info at wealthbuildingcpa.com, info at wealthbuildingcpa.com, and give me your email address and your phone number to make sure that we get out this information to you. But everybody after this call, you know, you're going to be able to um, hear this call again because we have it recorded, and you're also going to get the PowerPoint presentation so you have those materials. And I'll also send you a comprehensive information about the Wealth Building Plan and how you can set up an appointment to go visit TJ in Pittsburgh. Okay. And Barry? Yes. I have a question. Um, with respect to uh, wholesaling properties, and I think just piggyback on that last question, you know how we create the, the LLC and then we um, assign the interest in the LLC? Mm-hmm. With respect to taxes, because we actually formed that LLC, LLC. Do you suggest that we not file for the EIN where we put our personal information and we just leave that to the responsibility of the person we assign the LLC to? It depends on the timing. If the end of the year is coming up and that property is not yet sold, then it might make sense that you go ahead and get the EIN number. Now, when we talk about asset protection, we're not really talking about asset protection with the IRS or with the bank, or institutions like that are not coming after you for your assets. So you really can use your Social Security number and your address when you are dealing with the entity. But when it comes to outsiders, the public, people that would sue you and literally take you to court, that's where we're worried about asset protection. So when you do the EIN number, you can use your home address. You can list yourself at the member. That's what the IRS even if you were to get audited or anything like that, if that ask, if that LLC has been sold, you're not going to have any issues with the IRS. So usually what I advise is if come November, December, you still have this property and it doesn't look like you're able to assign your interest yet, it would make sense that you go ahead and get an EIN number so that for tax purposes, when you file the tax return, you can list that property as inventory. So it, it and it all depends on what you're doing. You know, are you currently rehabbing it? You know, what's going on? Or are you just, you know, doing a straight wholesale? So usually I look at it in terms of time. And you know, if the end of the year is approaching December 31st, 
it might make sense that at that point um, you consider giving the EIN number. Okay, thanks. I have one other question. Um, okay. When you're forming uh, LLC, uh, does it make a difference, I guess, whether you have a single member LLC or a multi-member? When would you need um, a multi-member LLC? Okay, let me put it this way. You see everything I just said about having a toxic LLC? Mm -hmm. The single member is one of the most toxic LLCs out there. The uh, veil okay. can be pierced on a single member LLC. You pay more taxes when you have a single member LLC because you're having to file a Schedule C for business income and Schedule E for rental income. We usually suggest that you do a multi member LLC, no matter how small you are. And you can find anybody to be the other member. So I told you guys that I consult for um, one of the largest real estate investors. What they do, it's a standard thing everybody knows on each of their properties. The main guy, which is the guy that I work for, owns 99%. And then his wife owns 0.5%. And then his children split the other 0.5% three ways. So really, when you have a multi-member LLC, it does not have to be a 50-50 LLC. It can be a 99.5 for you and 0.5 for the other person. That's enough to establish it as a multi-member. And it can be anybody. You can find anybody who will take on that 0.1 or 0.01% interest. If you don't take out anything else from this call, stay away from single-member LLCs and make sure that you have an operating agreement and make sure that when you run your business, you know how to pitch a deal. You have your business cards. You're open and honest with people. You look people in the eye, build relationships, and not try to build a business. These are the main things I want you to take away from this call. We're going to start winding down, um, so um, I'm going to take a couple of more questions, but we're going to start winding down here. Do we have any more questions? I, I just yes. have a, a follow-up on, on this question that you just answered, uh, Barry. Um, mm -hmm. This is Philippe from uh, Long Island. Um, again, I, I appreciate the, the, the seminar has been wonderful. I learned a lot. So you're, you're saying that if, you're, if you have an LLC with your wife, despite mm -hmm. his, she's being your wife or your, your spouse, uh, it, you're, you're, as, as far as liability is concerned, you're protected. They can't come after you or your wife, despite your yeah, being a Yeah, one of the things couple. that we put in the operating agreement is that when you have a husband and wife that are members of the LLC, for purposes of the LLC, they are completely separate members. They are not treated oh, together, okay. completely separate. So okay. now, uh, to follow up with that same question, <laughs> I, I I don't know. I was advised to to, to have a single member LLC. So what do I need to do to change it to a multi member? Um, it would be you would need to revise your operating agreement, and you need to. And one thing I tell people that when you revise it to do the operating agreement, you necessarily don't have to find the member until you are ready to file the tax return. So one of the things that you can do is to have an operating agreement that's properly executed, but before you file the tax return, that's when you need to identify who that member is so you have time. So the operating agreement is where you would now execute a new multi-member operating agreement, and then when you file your tax return, we do an election to reclassify the single-member LLC to a multi-member LLC, and all of that can be done at tax time when you when you are filing the tax return. It does not have to be done up front. In the past, they required you to do it up front before a certain date. Now, when you're oh. converting from single-member LLCs to multi-member LLCs, they can be done on the tax return. That's good to know because I, when I filed it, I know that when I got the apply for my a number. That was what they asked me, and I told them what was a single, so I do need to change that. Okay. That was very good. Thank you so much. All right. Um, TJ, um, could you make your closing comments as we wind down here? And like I said, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact either one of us. We're always available. Um, you know, we do want some kind of feedback. If you want to have these webinars every month, send us an email. We'll always tell us what topics you want to cover. Because we see the need out there in visiting different real estate clubs, 
we realize that um, we do need to have people that are authentic and honest out there and giving information and not just, you know, trying to sell you a product or get you to go to a boot camp or courses. I think we, we that's not what we're about. We're here to make sure that you are making money in real estate, which is the whole reason why you started this in the first place. Yeah, I just want to um I want to thank everybody for being on the call. Um thank you Abear once again for uh, pairing up with me on this on this webinar. Uh awesome webinar, a lot a lot of helpful information. Um I am going to either tomorrow or the next day I am going to have a YouTube video um of a uh, about a about a 20 25 minute presentation I did on the same thing up on the home page of my website if ever, anybody wants to see that in more de in more detail. Um, once again, the website's www.investinpittsburgh.net. And I just want to uh, just agree with a few of the things a bear said. You know, if, you're gonna, if you take one thing or a few things away from this phone call, please take away um, what a bear said um, about having an operating agreement, not having a single member LLC, uh, being very professional in your business pitch, uh, a bear and myself are both uh, have the same values and morals when it comes to many things in life, including business, and and that is uh, treating people right and doing things right. And by signing up for a bear's ultimate um, her plan, um, you're going to be being very proactive, setting yourself up for success. And um, at Rural Real Estate Investment Services, we've set up a process that works uh, similar to, like a bear has set up a process that works. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. We've set up a process that works. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you want high cash flow properties to provide high cash on cash returns, um, where you're able to get into single families totally renovated for as low as thirty five, forty thousand dollars dollars um, there's no reason to go out there and try to reinvent the wheel, especially if you want to be in America's number one most livable city. Uh, ranked for the second year in a row, which is Pittsburgh, PA. So I just thank everybody for your time, and uh, and I just want to end on um, have a wonderful, blessed evening. All right. Thanks, TJ. I absolutely enjoy doing these webinars with you, and I'm seeing a lot of people sending in these rave reviews. Um, thank you, Ribera. This was a great um, webinar, and you answered several questions that have been bothering me. I would like us to do this webinar once a month. Another person said this was great. You know, I'm glad that you guys were able to answer questions. Um, so I thank everybody. Again, like I said, visit us at the www.wealthbuildingcpa.com. Um, for those that might be interested in my wealth building program, um, we're going to send information on that. The reason why we don't like to do that on the call is we want this to be an educational call. This is not a selling webinar. This is an educational webinar. So if you want to sign up for my program, we will send you the information in your email um, where you can um, get this information, and then we can take it from there. I'm getting a lot of thank yous from Regina and Jerry. Thank you both. This was very informative. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and end the conference. Um, we will see you next month. It looks like a lot of people are asking for us to do this once a month, so I'll get with TJ. And if you have any topics that you want us to cover, um, feel free to shoot us an email, and we will try to cover it. Have a great and wonderful